Indian government had 3000 crores as a sports budget. Sport in India is a state subject. States are not taking this on priority to do many things. What are you doing which the government institutions are perhaps not doing? Abhinav Bindra had broken many myths that were surrounding Indian sport. That to be the best in the world, it is a process. That is what was lacking over here. Bhavani Devi, in her application form, she had said, if I don't get any support, this is my last year of playing the sport. We've lost many talents like that. India's history of Paralympics and para-athletes, what looks to be a future to us? India's in the top three in the world with people with disabilities. Now you have a few role models like Sumit Ante, Suhas, Deepa Malleka, Varun Bhati, Devendra Jadaria. People now know that I can also create an identity for myself through sport. Indian Army to a larger extent contributed immensely to Indian sport. Neera Chopra is a function of that. Cricket is the religion of the country. It's also unfair, right? BCCI is an excellent example of what a federation must be. And why are you doing what you're doing? Rani Rampa. All we ended up giving her was a scholarship of 6,000 rupees. So suddenly she became the breadwinner of the family. So for us, excellence is worth pursuing. But what is the starting point? India was one of the first countries in the world to mandate CSR. In the last five years, only 1% has come to sport. Hi, welcome to The Other Side. I'm your host, Dilip, an entrepreneur and an endurance athlete. In this podcast, we will explore the experiences of high-performing individuals while unpacking their mental and physical fitness routines that took them to where they are. Hi, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Today's episode is all about sports. Sports, not the way what you know, a lot what we don't know. What is sports in the country? How does the sporting system works? How does the sport administration works? Olympics, Paralympics, a lot more. And to discuss this, I have uh, Deepti Bopaya, who is the CEO of Go Sports Foundation. It's going to be a very interesting conversation. Let's get into the podcast. All right, uh, Deepti, thank you for taking time having this conversation. This conversation is about to understand what is sports for India. Is India really a sports loving country or a sports playing country? what an aspiring athlete should know, mm. what a parent of a young athlete should know. So we want to cover a lot. You are the right person. But before that, what got you to what you do right <clears> now? <throat> Thank you so much, Dilip. So uh, excited to be here. I've been watching all the podcasts and very, very inspired by, you know, sometimes all the people I've seen also, I, I thought that I knew them quite well. But then I think you were able to, you know, uncover many things. Uh, so I am uh, from Kurg originally. Um, but born and brought up in Bangalore. I have to say that this is not a Kook sponsored <laughs> podcast. We yeah, have at least I... <laughs> seven to eight people here representing Kook. But yes, please but ahead. but I like that because you're talking sport, health, and Kook invariably fits in somewhere, right? Yes. Uh, and a small community like us is actually producing many, many, many champions. I think that's quite exciting. Uh, my parents. Are sports people. My mom played hockey, she was a mountaineer, my dad is obsessed with tennis. So growing up for my sister and me was sport. And in the Coog families, they say studies were okay, were average, you please focus on sports. So it was never like leave the sport and study. It was, you know, do your studies, but sport is very important. So uh, growing up, played tennis, uh, basketball for school, for university, uh, played tennis for the state, dabbled in two sports. Um, one was because it was an individual sport and my dad's obsession of tennis. And, uh, you know, basketball was more about having a team and playing, you know, understanding what it means to be winning because of a team. And a large part of who I am today, even when I look at every single scenario is you go back to what you did when you played sport back then and continue to play now. And, uh, you know, obviously in the world that I am in with uh, Olympians and Paralympians, it is important to remotely try and walk the talk and stay fit. Yeah. You've also played tennis at state level. Yes. You were uh, playing basketball as well. Yes. Right. So at that point, uh, when you're making the decision of either pursuing a sport as a career or getting into corporate, how did you make that decision? You know, when I look back now, it was not a decision because we were going along. You were not really the best at that point of time or you were not really bad. You were still making teams, you were still traveling and it was an expensive affair. I mean, 
I do come from a you know privileged background, but it is still expensive. You you go all the way, and at time it was trains. You travel, go to Jaipur and Bhopal first round, and sometimes you're out, right? So it's a it's an expensive affair at that point of time, and you had to constantly. uh you know decide whether you want to continue playing the sport or not uh when i think back at no point uh in my growing up there was this conversation about getting to the pinnacle of sport it was about enjoy the sport play sport stay fit and now I, it's like a mission that i'm on that to actually talk to schools about what does it mean to be an olympian and a paralympian you know today we're talking about the olympics and all of that but i don't think a lot of us had yeah. that opportunity to even understand what it means you heard a pt usha you heard a nashwini nachpa you heard about uh, you know abhinav bindra much later but there was no thing of how in school i become an olympian but today's kids are different yeah and i mean many examples of that so it was not a choice between sport and corporate mm-hmm. at all it was just like hey you're not there as yet mm-hmm. uh you're playing average you're not in the top uh five in the country so you know it's going to be tough so you better find another alternative career to mm-hmm. manage your life and uh, sustain yourself because sport might not be able to do that okay. um i remember it was a time even when rohan bopanna was playing and uh, you know he, at that time we were all playing he, he was much senior to me but we were playing and you know winning and losing most of the time but to stay at it you know his resilience yeah. is something else yeah. uh, he's still playing you know and yeah. all of us have kind of fallen off the crack yeah. so i think uh, for me it was just about play the sport enjoy the sport take everything that it you know has taught me uh, i remember in mount carmel um, you know we used to run a basketball tournament and the college would only give us certain percentage of money to run it and everything else that you wanted if you wanted uniforms if you wanted uh, entertainment if you wanted music you have to go raise your funds so my first fundraising actually happened in college without mm. you actually knowing what uh, it is going to teach you other you know going yeah. randomly to a neighbor or a politician and banging the door and saying can you please sponsor our event so i think a lot of the life skills and everything that i do today is all because of my experiences through sport mm. which i'm extremely grateful for that we had access to play and we had those opportunities and because i played in two sports very different sports team sport and individual sport it was two different worlds uh you know we would go for tournaments in tennis and you had slightly you know privileged kids over there and we stayed in better places when we went with basketball tournaments we would stay in boys hostel classrooms god knows where all we would we stayed you know to play tournaments so i think uh, when i look back how far we've come in the journey yeah. of indian sport is very very um, humbling uh, and most importantly for me to be able to come back to sport so once i you know finished my um, graduation i went into symbiosis for my mba i did my masters in uh, finance and marketing and uh, i also did uh, on the side an ma in economics and um, i was very clear that you know i i'm not sure what i want to do i mean i'll i'll figure it out marketing or finance and then uh, I've always been fascinated by uh, Disney, and I read this art. You know, that time we didn't have internet so much, so mm. we would go to the library. So just to and, set the context, this is we are talking about early two thousands. Yeah, mm. about two thousand five. Right at that point, we would uh, we would have to fix the time to go and check your email yeah. and all of that. Yeah. So newspapers were <laughs> once in few days. <laughs> once in few days, right? So this, uh, you know, I saw that uh, Disney Channel has come into India, and um, I was like, oh my god, that's pretty cool. so i randomly wrote to them and said can i be in you know can i do my internship over there and in two days later when i checked my email they actually responded and said come down to uh, to bombay and i went down did my um, you know uh, interview over there got into disney and then suddenly i thought about oh this is a pretty cool career and then finished my two months of internship uh, did another internship with google and then came back in campus placements day 0 you know the pressure of day 0 all the things that you want to do goes away and you just want to get placed and at that point of time hsbc had come on campus and i was like mm, this is an interesting role let me try and give this a shot and i you know went for my interview and uh, 
the job profile of a wealth manager of you know creating wealth and yeah. impacting lives was very exciting for me so i yeah. sat there and i got the job <laughs> never knowing that i'd ever want to be a banker in my life but uh, i think today for the role that i do that 6 years of my life uh, has contributed so much uh, because of running a not for profit organization in our country it's all about process systems transparency money most of the times when you talk about uh, charity organizations in the country they're like we don't know where our money went we don't know where they you know who's the beneficiary yeah. so i think building a credible organization a large part of it for me was really from the bank and also our co-founder one of our co-founders nandan is uh, got the legal side of it yeah. so i think between banking and legal we were sorted to create a really yeah. good uh, you know organization in so that so right now uh, you're the ceo of go sports foundation Uh, Nandan Kamat, you mentioned one of your co-founders. Uh, talk a little bit about what Go Sport is and uh, why is the work what you do important. So I'm going to go a little bit into when I was in the bank. Uh, you know, 2012 Olympics was a turning point for me because. Uh, everyone was talking about every 4 years as indians we want to know like everybody suddenly has their interest and attention up and 2012 olympics um, uh, you know this was a really um, lovely setting of us having a great month going out and the olympics was going on so i turned on the uh, tv in the this is 2012 london olympics 2012 london mm. olympics so you know we i kind of switched on the tv in this restaurant and said hey the olympics is on let's go and a bunch of my colleagues were like why are you wasting your time india is anyway not going to do it so i don't know what happened at that point but i got so angry that we fellow indians are saying we cannot do it in sport and i've always followed sport to that extent so after that day i was constantly looking for you know i think i've done well over here in the bank i was in in the banking world uh, being a vice president is a big deal i was one of the youngest in the bank um at that point of time and um, um but something was missing you know and i just felt after that incident i have to be in sport in some way shape or form so i started looking at federations i started looking at how do i work with the olympic association how do i and then a common friend introduced me to another founder abhishek lakshmi narayan of uh, go sports and um, we started talking and just their vision of what they had set up was very interesting to me i think it all it said at that point of time is how do we create olympians for india it was it was it was very straightforward uh you know 2012 they had just set up the systems in terms of process. there's a lot of legal stuff that you need to do to get your trust in place so just that narrative of how do you create olympians for india uh, and paralympians for india st- struck a chord with me in a in a very meaningful way and just the vision of what they wanted to build was very exciting for me so when i spoke to them and understood uh, at that time i think there were only 12 athletes that they were working with um struggling to raise for funds because it was friends family um you know where you're trying to get a shoe or a flight ticket or a sponsor one competition very basic stuff and i felt like this is worth my time i i I'm okay to leave something uh I can always go back to the bank and I had super bosses who said you know in fact I put in my papers in August they didn't let me go in August they finally you know said December is a good time and I was like sure that I want to be here so go sports is one of those organizations uh in the ecosystem today which is really uh, which where we believe that there's immense talent in India what is missing is the pathway and the opportunity and uh, what we've been able to do obviously thanks to so many people who've been part of this journey um family supporters donors who've understood that vision that when you talk about creating an olympic or a paralympic champion it is not a one day two day one year effort um getting a medal is probably the second outcome the first outcome to even become an olympian takes years at least an 8 to 10 to 12 year cycle uh, to make it i mean hs pranoy was one of our first yeah. athletes 
uh, he had just about won the youth Olympics at that point of time and we started working with him and you know we thought from here the next Olympics he's going to be there he's going to be the youngest but then life happens to an yeah. athlete right there's so many other things that that yeah. uh, that happen so I think for us it started with a with a vision of how do we create a system and a process uh, what are the beliefs in Indian sport you know at that point of time 2008 when we started Abhinav Bindra had won his Olympic gold medal it shattered a belief that an Indian can win an Olympic gold medal, which was very exciting because we are talking about can we send a large contingent, but over here there is this person who comes from a well-to-do family. Uh, because again, there's this narrative that only if you're from a humble background, you can I, Abhinav kind of broke many, many, many myths that were surrounding Indian sport. That to be the best in the world, yeah. it is a process. And that is what was lacking over here. There is no... Uh, lack of talent, there is no lack of intent, there is no lack of funding also, I would say. Um, but systems and processes. And when you look at India on the whole and, you know, with the work that you've been doing and uh, everything happening around us, there's so many important problems to solve for India. Basic things. Yeah. So sport in my initial conversations were all, but why sport? Why will we give you money for sport? Right? It was like a luxury to say we'll support an athlete because if somebody is giving a crore of rupees today through you know CSR, I can support 20, uh, maybe about 2,000 kids with the same funds, but that one crore might be only for five or seven athletes. Yeah, uh, these are very jarring um, observations. Yeah. In any country, when we talk about, we talk about sport being an identity as a country. Right? But of course, every country has their national sports. India also has its national sports, which sadly is not national conversation. Help me and the audience understand the tree or the taxonomy of what sports systems mean in India. Like, <clears throat> So the general understanding is there's a sports ministry we have got. They should be doing all that yeah. work. You spoke about 20,000 athletes out there. You spoke about money. Last I read, last year alone, Indian government had some 3,300 crores as a sports budget. So we'll we'll touch upon yeah. what happens when a government allocates budget. How does it get deployed? But yeah. take one step back. How does the system of sports work in India? So sport in India is a state subject. Many times we constantly keep saying the government should do it, the central government should, should should actually do something about sport. But actually, if we need sport to improve, it is the state government initiatives that can actually change how the entire, the 20,000 people that we're talking to actually sit in different states of this country. So, so all the news, the media, what is writing, government of <coughs> India, government of India, then it should be a government of an ex state. Uh, so that's the gap. Uh, so while it is a state subject, states are not taking this on priority to do many things. In the recent past, you've heard Odisha and you know few northeast states and everybody doing some great work. Uh, but otherwise, it goes back to the government. So when you look at the structure of Indian sport, mm -hmm. you have the uh, Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sport, okay. which is led by the sports minister. Mm -hmm. And I've been in sports administration now for 12 years and it's the fifth sports minister I'm interacting with, mm. right? So there is change, there is thought process which is different, but the last three sports ministers have, con there's been a continuity of whatever, you know, processes. And, and we have a new sports and, minister this term. Yes, yeah. um, we had an opportunity to meet him as well, but the sports ministry is in charge of the development of sport in the country. Okay. And uh, there is the Sports Authority of India, which is which sits under the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sport. So that's a federation which comes under the government. It's not a federation; it's a okay. government body. Okay. Uh, okay. The Sports Authority of India. What does uh, so Sports Authority so SAI? SAI. So yeah. what does SAI do, which the ministry doesn't do? So it's like a, a feeder system. Okay. The budgets are announced to a particular ministry. Okay. And then one of the verticals is the Sports Authority of India. Okay. So the Sports Authority of India takes care of close to 80 SAI centers in the country. Okay. Every remote location of this country that you can think of actually has a Sports Authority of India. Wow. And many, many, many athletes that we see today have been a product of 
Sports Authority of India. And these are installed by the central government? Yes. Okay. By, by the Ministry of Minist Youth, of, mm. uh, Youth Affairs and Sport, which sits under that particular government. So all these uh, setups that are there, we keep talking about there's no infrastructure, there's no pathway, there's no thing. I think there is, but it's how it is managed is where the gap happens sometimes, right? Okay. Uh, and um, today there are about 20 to 23, I think, center of excellences in Sports Authority of India amongst this 80 odd centers. Okay. So if there is a national camp for boxing, if there's a national camp for athletics, if there's a national, it all sits in these. Uh, so they are sports specific center of excellences. I mean, it's a it's a multi-sport, okay. but it is it can be in Patiala, for example, or okay. Sonipat, or you know, there are multiple. Okay. Bangalore is a big uh, center of excellence as well. So they have multi-sports where they get the national teams to train. So whenever there is that facility available, that means mm. it is at the top, right, mm. in terms of uh, availability, uh, infrastructure and everything else. And I think it has evolved over a period of time. So even if you go back to the time of Pulela Gopichan and Aparna Popat, they were all training in Sai Bangalore. Okay. Uh, you know, at, so the Sai setup has always been there. Okay. Another entity or stakeholder that has contributed immensely to uh, Indian sport is the forces, okay. Indian Army. Uh, the Navy and the Air Force, Indian Army to a larger extent because they, as part of their training, the military training, mm. a large chunk of it is also in through sport Sports quota. because yeah. they also believe in the leadership side of, you know, how an individual's yeah. leadership gets built. So they have something called as the boys sports company. Across all the locations of Indian Army, they go to the remotest of places of India. They find young boys at the age of... 9, 10, 11, bring them to their centers, then teach them sport and then decide which sport they should play. And from there you see, so a Neera Chopra is a, a, is a function of that. So what is the Western interest for the armed forces to do this? <clears throat> so they want, uh, I mean, there is something called as the World Military Games, okay. uh, which is a very big, uh, you know, in, in, in okay. amongst all countries. Uh, but I think sport is a very integral part of any uh, person in the army. Yeah. I, you know, they, it is part of their life. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, they get in these kids. The reason I'm talking about it is you specifically asked me who are the stakeholders yeah. and what is the structure. Yeah. And sometimes we lose out. Of course, the, yeah, I could uh, never have thought that armed forces will fit into that structure. So Colonel Rathor, for example, who is also yeah. our sports minister. Is, yeah, Raghavendra Rathor. Yeah, so yeah. he actually also was part of the army. Right. So he learned the sport growing up, but you know, polished it at a much later stage. So I think the role of the army has been phenomenal. And very recently, about three months back, they've taken a very big step to introduce the girls sports companies. Interesting. Okay. Finally. I, I was just about to ask, you spoke about boys, why yeah, not girls? I specifically said right. boys because they only were doing boys. Okay. But now... For the longest time, they were doing only the boys? Only boys. Okay. Uh, and now they have started the girls sports company, which just got launched in a tie-up with the uh, Sports Authority of India. And, uh, you know, they have an Army Institute of Sport in Pune. Nice. A fantastic setup over there as well. So, I, I feel there have been stakeholders to bring the talent to the fore. Okay. But... What really happens is when they get to a national level, in our experience, it's been the most, it's, it's the most difficult time for an athlete because A, they are in that 10th, 12th standard or graduation, they're figuring what to do in their life. Mm. Uh, second, they are uh, in stages, different stages of puberty. Mm. They were probably shooting really well, playing really well, but suddenly they grow very tall and they can't play the sport. Their performances drop. They are going through physical changes, which is uh, yeah. they don't know about. Yeah. And you start seeing kids drop out. People attribute it a lot of times to just funding. But there are so many other elements yeah. uh, that uh, get a child to drop out no, of that's, sport. That's a very interesting point. That's another perhaps not so spoken about conversations that how, what are we not doing right in terms yeah. of talent development? Yeah. But I want to go back on the yeah. armed forces yeah. thing. So the <clears throat> armed forces which are uh, recruiting these boys and girls, yeah. do they also want them to serve 
yeah. in the forces. Yeah. So you're just not here to do the sport, but you should also serve there. Is yeah, that what the yeah, intent is? Yeah. Okay. So they get in at a subedar level. They okay. get in, you know, at, depending on. And so if they win medals, then they get a promotion. Okay. They get a ranking. It's all. There's a very good system in place. Okay. Uh, on how they recognize their athletes, take care of their athletes, and. Um, um, what they've also started is uh, they have a Paralympic node. So uh, people in the armed forces who lost either limbs okay. or, you know, during, hands, the service, during period. service period, they are now being pushed into Paralympic yes. sport, which is amazing because they're so strong mentally, physically. Uh, it's a it's a big talent pool in that sense, right? Yeah, and yeah. gives them another identity, a second chance at a lot of things that they want to do. I think the I was reading somewhere that the armed forces for them, it is serving the country mm. either on the battlefield or on, on the, the sports field. yeah that's impressive yeah <laughs> I, I yeah i mean thanks to you i i never knew about this element so let's go back on the chart so you yeah. have the ministry of youth and sports yeah. uh, you know then you have the sai you also have parallelly the armed forces yeah what goes down then then you have the federations okay and these uh, are sports specific these are sports specific federations okay. and uh, what happens is each uh, sports federation has to, uh, so it's a, it can be a group of people who come together and create a federation, but okay. then you have to get an uh, affiliation okay. under the uh, Indian Olympic Association. So you need to be, your sport needs to be affiliated to the, you, you need to be a member of it. Okay. And once you're a member of it, then you get an accreditation through the Sports Authority of India. So there is something called as um, ACTC where, uh, so for example, if I'm the Badminton Association of India, okay. uh, my job is to promote and grow the sport of badminton. So, this is a private body? These are private bodies, yeah. Okay, these are not these under are the not government under the charter. Gov yeah, okay. which is why you hear a lot of issues with sure. uh, federations, right? Because but how are they funded? Is the government uh, allocating a portion of their yes. budget to them? Yes, so if they are affiliated under the Olympic Association, then okay. they, they submit this calendar to Sports Authority of India. Okay. Then there's a committee there that sees it and then allocates the budget. So, your 3,600 crores goes to all your 80 centres, goes for... Uh, salaries of coaches goes for running and managing of that setup goes to the talent pool staying there for their food their, you, it's a lot of things to manage with such a small budget yes. the federations then receive funding through hmm. sports authority and they also have the ability to raise their own money okay so they can create their own properties because they are responsible to create tournaments in the country okay so they can raise sponsorship they can raise thing they have their own government so their charter structures. is to uh, expand the footprint of that particular sport in yes. the country. Yes. Okay. That is the core responsibility of them and also manage and nurture their talent. And who are these people? Are these exports uh, athletes? They are bureaucrats? Who are these people who are running it's the a, federation? It's a combination. I think okay. there is a lot of bureaucrats. Okay. Uh, just like how we have all our main sports as well. But there are also former athletes that are coming in now, which is very okay. heartening to see because okay. they're on athlete commissions. They're actually part of the decision making. I think uh, Athletics Federation of India, uh, you know, huge credit to the entire team there. You have Adil Somariwala, who himself was an uh, athlete. Anju Bobby George Anjubabi, now yeah. is yeah. there. Uh, shooting Federation, the turnaround that they have. In fact, most of their national coaches are former Olympians of the sport. Okay. You know, so they've got them back into the sport, which is incredible. Uh, okay. So the administration governance still sits with a set of people. The running and managing Operations. of talent okay. is a separate thing. Okay. Um, but but and each sport you said has a different its own yes, federation. Yes. But tell me if there is a football federation or a badminton federation which is already there, you and me today decides we want to create another federation. Can we? Yes, we can. You can, yeah. and I think that's where in certain sports we work with in Taekwondo. There are okay. two federations. Okay. Uh, gymnastics has two federations, but the important part is an athlete has to align. It always becomes difficult at an athlete stage because okay. an athlete has to align with a federation who has the ability and power to send their entry for a competition. Okay. Now I could we could all set up federations, but if you are not, we don't have the international body affiliation and the Indian Olympic Association affiliation then we are of no use. You'll be promoting the sport, sure. but you won't have the right or the power to send an entry for a competition. So between the Ministry of Youth and Sports and SAI, where does IOC come? Uh, IOA. Uh, Indian I Olympic Association. Yeah, right? IOA is a separate independent body again. 
okay. there is no uh, they don't sit under anyone it's an okay. independent body which again is in touch with the government and is in touch with the federations okay. and they are also uh, they are responsible to improve the olympic uh conversations in this country for example the movement itself was set up for uh, you know to build the sporting culture uh, uh you know the values of olympics has to really go into schools and institutions and federations and also they are the uh, governance body to ensure the olympic movement in the country continues similarly you have the paralympic committee of india and both of these report to or sit under the international body so you have the international olympic council okay. and you have the um, um international uh, ipc international paralympic committee okay. uh, uh, you know so two entities that sit out of different things so every country would have their paralympic uh, national uh, uh, committee so committee and the olympic committee and yes. they report into the international yes. pieces for the longest time i was under the impression they are all reporting into either sai or uh, the government they don't report but i think there is they work they work finally. i mean there okay. are partners okay. or they are all key stakeholders for the sport you are saying that there yeah. is possibility that each sport can have more than one federation right but each of these federations identity is only established when they get aligned to its international counterpart yeah. how does a taekwondo athlete choose between a and b federation whom should i be part of so that, that's where it gets very difficult for an athlete because the athlete should not be worrying about mm. you know should i go with this entity or this entity i need to go for that tournament whoever is going to send my entry i will go with them right so it is important at an athlete side to understand which is the affiliated uh, federation right that is something we should do our checks before we kind of start going because at the end of the day you might not be able to travel or you mm. may be able to travel for other competitions where anybody can send an entry mm. but the main ones if you're going for an asian games you're going for a you know specific olympic event or qualifiers or anything world championships it's not going to be your entry will not be accepted oh, okay so it's important to you know be part of the right uh, federation and this is regardless whether you represent the country or you are it's a it's a tournament where country representation is not there let's say about tennis you're not most of the time representing the country so that's why tennis players don't go through this hassle okay. it's it's like i'm going and playing on my individual capacity right. and yeah i come from india okay so, so only for asian games or olympics you represent the country otherwise yes. you are an independent athlete but for these sports oh. but all other sports for example badminton i still have to go through the federation okay so that is why the role of the federation is very critical in indian sport interesting now uh, we, since we are speaking about federation um, i keep reading a lot about one federation which has done exceedingly too well which is the cricket federation so does bcci also fall under this arm of course we know that bcci doesn't need that much of money but is it also under that arm of ministry and sai and so forth the federation is totally independent to no it. again to the best of my knowledge they actually sit independently because these are all private bodies as a federation just like as any long, other sport just they... like any other sport okay. as long as you have your global affiliations sure. you still have certain things of reporting and information sharing and all of that that continues but i think bcci is an excellent example of what a federation must be and should do and should do yeah so I, <laughs> yeah so i i want to deep dive on that yeah. because i think that's where a lot of your hands on knowledge and experience comes because you are largely working in a non cricket yeah. uh, let's say sports arena right so i'm sure there's a lot of learning but quickly going back amongst all these entities ideally speaking these entities should be doing a good job in scouting the talent nurturing them getting to a level where they are representing the country going to the olympics right but now you also have these foundations like go sports and perhaps few others right why do we need these foundations now like we have so many layers of stakeholders mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know i'm not saying your job is irrelevant no your no i I, I like that but, question <laughs> but why do we need these foundations who are operating as a non-profit model yeah when there are so many federations so many stakeholders bureaucrats former athletes doing the same stuff so what are you doing differently yeah and why are you doing what you're doing okay so one more structure that in the ministry that i have not mentioned is something called as the uh, nsdf which is the national sports development fund okay so that was actually created uh, i think uh, early 2000s to provide the support for elite athletes 
Now, uh, that particular system started and uh, this was around the time when private organizations also started. So, I'm just trying to connect the two. So, this particular fund... By private, you mean uh, foundations like Foundations, okay. yeah. Okay. Foundations, uh, which is not connected to the government, right? Uh, so, so these this particular fund, NSDF funds, actually was created to give money to an elite athlete in case of an immediate request, which didn't have to go through the federation, okay. where the ministry and SAI could take a call on how to pay that athlete immediately. So, there's an important competition, I have to suddenly go there, I need to do, you know, I need funding. The process now is I have to go to the federation, federation has to send this. So, they could create it. So, the thought was there in terms of creating this body. But they should also be accredited and affiliated by the federation. Only then they yes, can be yes. eligible for that emergency fund. Yeah. No, but this is also by ranking, right? So, okay. if there is an Indian athlete in the top 15, it's evident. It's evident. Okay. So, there, there's not too much an athlete needs to do okay. for this. So, this NSDA funds is always been there, it's always available. A lot of the public sector companies ha have also been giving funds and CSR funds also go into that. Mm -hmm. But then they instituted something called as the Target Olympic Podium Scheme. Which is TOPS. Which is TOPS. Yeah. And, um, you know, I have the good fortune of actually sitting on that committee as well. And I'm the only non-Olympic athlete wow. <laughs> on that committee from an administration, on <laughs> on, from yeah. the, uh, administration side. But everybody else comes with a wealth of experience on playing sport at the highest level, right? I mean, as an athlete, your experience is very different. Um, and it is chaired by the um, uh, Director General of Sports Authority of India, who's currently uh, Mr. Sandeep Pradhan. So, uh, and then that we then report into the sports minister. Okay. So, all the past, uh, you know, uh, conversations have been through that. Now, it's a very interesting model. The target Olympic podium scheme was done specifically to take care of just-in-time support of athletes and also create a pipeline of young athletes. So, they have a junior program and they have a tops program. Again, I, I also want you to tell that if the NSDF you said yeah. is existing, why then entities like you yeah. should be there? So, I think it comes back to how it is managed and the uh, the, the professional team managing an entity, right? Because okay. over there, there is a lot of systems because it's government funding, it's tax funding, it is, it's public funds, right? You can't, you can't just, without a process that the government has instituted, you can't just take money and say, oh, this person's really talented, let me give them five lakhs. I think... A large part of why organizations like us exist is because we are able to probably raise funds mm. from the large population of this country who want to participate in Indian sport mm. and who wanted a platform to participate mm. and also see results. Now, when we started 16 years ago, um, one of the uh, athletes we started supporting, our early scholarships was H.S. Pranoy, Rani Rampal. Team. Captain of the Indian hockey team, but yeah. at that time, a supremely talented young girl who needs a lot of support. Also, father is a cart puller, comes mm. from a region called Shabad in Haryana, which uh, and Haryana itself has from a female infanticide yeah. ratio. You know, it's like girls can't play, girls yeah. can't do anything, and hockey, that hub has created so many national champions today. Uh, so, over there, all we ended up giving her was a scholarship of 6,000 rupees every month. But her father's best day was 250 rupees a day. So suddenly she became the breadwinner of the family. We probably supported her only for five, six years. And once she made it to the Indian team, we consciously decided not to do team sport because every single athlete had an yeah. additional need, yeah. right? Uh, but what it did, Dilip, at that point of time was it gave her access to nutrition support. It gave her equipments which otherwise they could not afford. It gave her something more to deliver the talent that she has. And I think what we've been able to do for these individual athletes uh, across all the different organizations, um, you know, has has really been that just-in-time support. So, for example, if I have an athlete who's training in Hyderabad uh, and uh, has has a very bad injury. Uh, if I were to go through the federation and the process and the system, it's going to take time, like any other process, right? Uh, today, we have athlete managers. The athlete can just call up the athlete manager, say, 
buddy, I've had a fall. I think this is serious. What do we do? He's immediate, he or she is immediately sent into an sent for an X-ray, an MRI. There's a doctor on call. We will get that back end done. We will get the process done. We will do everything. And it's just in time because we have that funding and the decision making is in our governance structure. So this athlete manager, just to set the context, yeah. are these individuals which the athlete recruit so that they can manage their these operations? These are athlete managers sitting, at least in Go Sports Foundation, we have this athlete manager okay. concept okay. where... Each of our athletes are aligned and assigned to an athlete manager. Okay, there's a dedicated athlete there's manager. There's a dedicated okay. athlete manager. Who is, whose sole, I would assume, KPI is to make sure yes. that athlete is not overburdened. Yeah. Uh, he's just focusing on yes. the sport. Yes. So, okay. travel bookings. Uh, what is the nearest place to eat? My luggage didn't come. Nice. What what do I need right now? So the yeah. amount of time that is spent, we can't equate it to the funding always. It is sure. actually the time... Uh, that we end up spending to build these relationships. And sometimes we've seen um, many athletes have actually no one to speak to when they lose. So I want to pause here. So I want to talk deep dive into what you do yeah. as a foundation. Yeah. But before that, uh, uh, before that, uh, we spoke about the NSTF. We spoke about Go Sports. Uh, who are the people who run foundations like Go Sports? I'm sure there are you know, a dozen more foundations. Yeah. And what's your vested interest? Like, I, I mean, I would assume for a minister or a bureaucrat, there is a certain vested interest, right? For a former athlete, there is, right? But including you and all the other pe people, they are private players, right? You had a corporate career. Uh, you're transitioning from A to B as a uh, career. Why are you doing this thing? Because you are not doing it. I mean, you are not playing the sport, yeah. right? It's not yet your family members are playing. Yeah. Why are these individuals putting together these foundations, raising money, which is CSR money, and doing what they do? What you do, we'll talk about it. Yeah. But why are you doing this? <laughs> uh, so for me personally, it is, I think it's a service to the country. Uh, if we want to see some change in this world, you should be part of the change. And I think there are enough people who can be bankers and make rich people richer. Uh, but for me personally, it was waking up every morning and wondering, what am I doing? If I have a problem that needs to be solved, I need to be part of that system or part of that solution. So when I got this opportunity with Go Sports and, you know, meeting my trustees and founders and just hearing their vision of what they want to do, I felt like I found a pathway for my own selfish reasons. I could not be in a you know, elite athlete myself. But today, being part of over 300 athletes' lives, I feel like, okay, I am somewhere in the Indian sport uh, scenario. So, is, so it, is it patriotism? Is it... Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, is it uh, the love of the sport? Because it's a very selfless act, right? I mean, uh, you're I trying to... I think it's to... patriotism for sure. It's, mm. about, it's about nation building through sport. And mm. I think the fact that we have... 120 athletes representing India at the Olympics and then we'll have another 70 at the Paralympics. And when that national anthem plays, I was in uh, Rio uh, for the Paralympics and uh, every time the national anthem plays, everyone in the stadium has to stand. Yeah. And you know, sometimes you get these goosebump, goosebump moments, moments yeah. uh, and reasons of why you do what you do. Sure. For me... One of them was at Rio when uh, the entire stadium stood up for our national anthem. You know, because till then I was sitting and every other national anthem was playing. And even sure. then when you're standing for another country's national anthem, it's nice. But when, when our uh, national anthem played and, um, you know, just, just being there at that moment, I think you want to be part of something that's putting India on a world map. And I think that sure. is what this job gives me. No, it's amazing. Like, I mean, uh, thank you for what you do. Thank you for <laughs> thank all you. the other, uh, you know, kind-hearted, nice people like you who are doing this uh, yeah. because uh, we have seen a lot of non-profit foundations, which obviously does from a inclusivity point of view, a lot of work, but to do it in sports, you you have to be more than a dreamer. You have to be more than a think beyond being a change maker because you're trying to build an Olympian who is perhaps 
sometimes not even born yeah <laughs> right but building an infrastructure for them or someone who is just and two year old five year old yeah. and thinking that you know maybe 2036 yeah. uh, you know that boy or girl might be representing the country so you know <laughs> great work thank you so thank you i mean i must mention also you know i think it's it's the incredible uh, kind of people and team members who've also joined so in all organizations that work in sport i think yeah. the one stand out like you mentioned is we feel like we're, we we are getting that opportunity to be part of, of the course. india story right in of some course. way shape or form so i think huge credit to every single Everyone. person yeah, of course. I mean, uh, we have had the opportunity to know the work what you do the your team do and we are happy to be a partner to you now that we know what why you do uh, let's also try to understand what organization like go sports or other foundations in what are you doing uh, as a charter as a mandate uh, which the government institutions or the federations are perhaps not doing because your intent is also for athlete development for yeah. athlete support so what we've uh, been able to build in the last 16 years is really a credible platform for an athlete or an individual who wants to participate in sport or a corporate who wants to participate in sport because most of the time you know you end up saying oh i got this particular athlete profile they really need the support can you support them now there is intent to support but then they also don't know once they give the money what happens there's no follow ups reporting and all of that and why does a corporate need to support i mean why does they need to participate in sport uh so very interestingly uh, in 2013 the uh, corporate social responsibility laws were released okay. and india was one of the first countries in the world to mandate csr impressive and uh, csr in sports no just csr oh, as okay. a concept oh, itself okay, okay. because everybody did it on their own yeah. now it was a mandate if you are earning yeah. this kind X of profits 2% yeah. has to come in uh, to these categories so when those categories were being done it was a very broad thing for training in sport there was no specifics on what it was really required but at that time i remember uh, you know abhinav bindra and a couple of people actually wrote back to the ministry of corporate affairs and said that you need to be specific on what these areas are so that is when they trained changed the entire mandate and called it training towards olympic paralympic and rural sport which is part of the schedule 7 of the csr now what that did dilip was till 2013 mid or even till the end all my conversations were in the range of 50000 10000 one lakh was a great amount so this is foundations like you who operate as a non profit yes seeking funding. support and funding yes. from donors who yes. are corporates and telling them uh, why you should spend your csr yeah. money on sports yeah. and what csr did was it was not getting us to convince them but the ministry itself had listed it that it is one of the important topics as part of nation building but is that spend on sports also a mandate yeah it can be so a okay. corporate has a choice to do education or environment or sport okay. sport was never there but it became a category hmm. and now that it became a category our conversations got better and all the partners that we've got so far in the last 16 years are largely in the belief of nation building they believe that sport has a very critical role in society um we are not promising any medals we cannot promise medals what is so dynamic and you have no idea what's going to happen but what we're saying is there's talent let's give them the opportunity to be the best versions of themselves okay so for us excellence is worth pursuing so if you take uh, for example um, adipa karmakar mm. right she nobody spoke about gymnastics mm. and she comes from the northeast of the region of the country picked up a sport like gymnastics she is uh, one of the five women in the world who does the prodonova vault which is called a death vault oh, yeah. so when we had that opportunity to actually work with her and a huge amount of credit to rahul dravid here he also is our ambassador and uh, of the foundation and when we were all sitting and brainstorming he he was like don't look at the sports that people tell us that india is traditionally good at go after the sports that actually have young girls and boys across the country playing and also is part of the olympics like there's a broad base today probably india participates in i think if i'm not mistaken 18 to 20 events so every time this conversation happens on how many medals will sure. india win i'm like 
<laughs> because we don't even have participation <laughs> exactly of yeah. right we sent our first fencer bhavani devi to uh, tokyo even then and 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 that i remember we picked up canoeing we picked up gymnastics we picked up taekwondo and these girls are incredible and we never knew that she's going to go to the olympics and finish fourth impressive and what we did for her at that point of time was very basic it was just more uh, you know her, her movement her physiotherapy her training her nutrition so you're supporting her saying that hey we will build the requisite resources you go out and find who yes. you want to get we will find so okay. we have uh, john gloster who is our director sports science i think the shift also happened for go sports once he joined in because initially our job was trying to get the funding but then now that we have the funding we want to have the right experts on board so john has put together an entire ecosystem of physios trainers biomechanics sports engineers everything we have in place anywhere in the world who we can access to train with our athletes okay. so it could be a mental conditioning expert it could be a best coach in the world so what organizations like us are providing is that just in time real time support Oh. if today we decide something has to be done by in two days they will be there so you are uh, you know in the tech world we call as a hybrid outsource high performance team right yeah. a, an athlete whom you decide to support yeah. if they are injured or if they have a nutrition issue or anything which is a hindrance for them to perform they can contact an athlete manager yeah. and say hey this is where i'm stuck yeah. and the athlete manager will just go out yeah. and uh, find a way to fix it for them yeah one is when they injured but when they come on board so we have an application process okay. athletes was, apply for yeah. our scholarship so, yeah i was about to ask how do you build your talent yeah. pool yeah so we have we actually uh, open out our applications at different points of time so that's where our csr partners come into play so we have different projects of different uh, corporates uh, so for example we've just opened a women in sport project right now where we've picked six sports badminton uh, shooting weightlifting boxing and athletics okay. for example hdfc bank is one of the largest uh, uh, banks with a largest csr portfolio for sports they never had sport 3 oh. years back they were doing small you know support to different organizations but they didn't have a program so when we actually sat with the team they were like we want to do sport but women is a big part of our theme so we were like okay great we'll curate something for you so that is also what go sports does we okay. are able to sit with people who want to get into sport and curate a very unique program so it's called uh, karke dikhaungi this program okay and it's for younger girls and uh, you know we started 3 years ago we have one olympian who's made it so what happens with our programs is we're able to reduce the number of time it actually takes because as talent there's attention there's funding there's no looking back who is this olympian which sport so uh, this is tanisha crasto in badminton, badminton. yeah oh. i mean she also gets support from others but yeah. i think the access to her sure. biomechanics and nutrition sure. and all of that she's also played with ashwini yeah so again great uh, combination course, over yeah. there so i think for us it is a, you know really trying to understand in badminton if you are working with 12 different athletes each of them have their own curated program okay. it's not the same similar thing so it's a combination so chirag satvik for example yeah. uh, they were not even playing doubles together when we were supporting them and one of the partners gave up the sport and these two were of the same height and then gopi and us had a conversation and said you know what we should look at doubles in a big way yeah. and today we are sitting there world number 1 yeah one of the <laughs> most hopeful gold medal uh, yeah, <laughs> i told yeah. you no medals we, we are not going to make any uh, projections <laughs> no, but then i mean you have your own scouting mechanisms yeah. right so you have a camp where all kids of whatever age come and they play yeah. different sports yeah. how do you program those systems so it is very dependent on the program project and budget dilip at this okay. stage it is not a standard thing that happens at the back end we have our scholarships open and people keep applying and depending on which program they fit we'll put them in but we have a research team who's constantly okay. reviewing state tournaments national tournaments and all of that very recently actually we launched a unique project with the uh, infosys foundation which is not for athletes but it is for academies because we realized today there is a there is good enough amount of funding coming in for young athletes and with the top scheme for example if you're a junior athlete in the top scheme you get about 25000 rupees a month of 
you know, no uh, no bills required. It's Junior, just we're out talking of about under sixteen. Uh, it is not under sixteen, under eighteen. Under eighteen. Under eighteen, okay. but also in terms of performance, they look okay. whether you're in junior tops. And if okay. you're in the tops, you get fifty thousand rupees a month for out of pocket expenses. Just if you're in nowhere in the world that happens, oh. right? So there is some funding if you're in these specific sports, which is Olympic medal probability. There is a pathway. We we love to take up problems. Which are difficult in Indian sports. So when we took up the Paralympic, uh, you know, part of it, it was nobody was really looking at para athletes at that point of yeah. time. Uh, again, it has been a combination of our partners who've come on board and said, "I am interested in this," and then we've curated something for them. And this athletes where we put out these applications, they then apply to us. Then we have a shortlist, and our process of shortlist is hundred days actually. So every time we uh, talk to a partner, they'll be like, "Can we start the program in one one month?" We're like, "No, we can't," because we want to work with these athletes over four to eight years. So we really need to spend time and understand who are we going to pick up. There may be athletes we pick up who also don't end up making it. Right? It could be because of life, because of injury, because of. I'm just done with the sport, sure. and that's a new thing we are seeing with young athletes. Early specialization, don't want to touch their rackets or equipment at 18, 19. So what happens to the rest of their life? Early burnout. Early burnouts are very, very. It's a big problem. That's we are going to see that, you know, unfolding sure. in a big way. But what does hundred days here mean? That you have to uh, choose an athlete, or you're going to give an outcome to the athlete that they are part of the program. We give them an outcome that they are part of the program, okay. and then we start working start with them. Working with them so for th number of years. For number of years. So then we, you know, we will start off with their blood tests. We'll start off with their biomechanics, body assessment. So we have a base that we work with. Then we sit with them, their coach, their parents. We do their goal sheets. We try and understand where the gaps Good are, sure. and then we map at the end of the year: Have we met those goals? Have we not met those goals? And when and you and you when you recruit or when you scout this talent and they say, hey, this is a potential talent for this particular sport, do you then sit down and tell the athlete, I'm going to support you for X number of years. I want a medal. I have a milestone for you to perform and show whether whatever I'm supporting is giving an outcome or is it, you know, blind support. Just keep playing. I will. How does how does the mechanics work? So we have a yearly renewal as well with the athlete. Okay. Uh, we will never drop an athlete when they are injured uh we will ensure that the athlete has reached to the best of their potential there have been many athletes we've picked at a national level moved to international asian games has been the top for example swapna berman she was a heptathlete india's first uh, athlete to win an uh, heptathlon gold yeah. uh, you know but we know that the olympic level is very tough to move from asian so for us that was the goal with her mm. so each athlete has a very different uh, goal post i would say and we work towards that so when we talk to a corporate about outcomes it's very broad at the program level we'll have a percentage of these athletes who make it to the olympics there'll be a percentage who go to the asian games there'll be a percentage who will not be injured through the year you know what is the recovery so our outcomes are based on that mm. and very significantly we also um, Work on the United Nations um, uh, SDGs as well, because most of the what does SDG mean? This is the Sustainable Development Goals, okay. uh, which is by the United Nations. So it is a very interesting model because they are checking different parameters on health, education, partnerships, uh, environment. Where are each of the countries? So you kind of report into the. main sdgs so when you talk about inclusion when you talk about disability when you talk about women they can also you know so the ministry of corporate affairs has a very very exhaustive and extensive way of reporting your projects mm. so just saying i'm in sport doesn't really cut the thing for right. them so all our projects are embedded into this so if you say a para athlete program has an inclusion element if you say women then it has a women it, and then you know obviously sport over sure. a period of time is also performance sure. so majority of our projects are a combination um obviously we want our athletes to win medals that is one of the best outcomes yeah. in sport but that is not the only outcome so when you work so uh, i mean now that the entire uh, landscape is defined thank you for that uh is the 
the operating playbook and how each foundation work like a go yeah. sports or others would be different but is the template and intent same that every foundation is working with this goal that i want to support sport and a certain deserving athlete because government might be doing or the federation might be doing but we are a bunch of people coming together and we want to do this for the reasons let's yeah. say patri patriotic reasons <laughs> or for the love of sport so yeah. is the templates overarching template same uh yeah i would say yes largely okay. but i think the uh, ways of how we've approached it yeah, are the playbooks different. would be very yeah. different yeah and uh, some have gone the infrastructure route which right. is the you know uh, belari center yeah. iis uh, ogq's model is slightly different because right. they're working towards the olympic gold medal Specific, yeah. uh, and they have junior programs coach sure. programs uh, you know we are slightly more broad based ours is also about creating role models for Got india right. uh, and and putting india on a world map then you have the reliance foundation then you know you have different organizations okay. that uh, you also have corporates today setting up their own foundation so you have dream 11's dream sports foundation yeah. that runs a program with us as well so it really depends on uh, what each one is doing but the underlying intent is to take this talent sure. to win on yeah. the world stage in fact i was just reading somewhere that um um the countries that have hosted the olympics are also in the top 10 in the world in terms of medal ranking there's a lot of conversation about india hosting the uh, 2036 2036 i mean i was i was there when that announcement happened in bombay uh, when our pmo actually mentioned it to be one of those uh, times of uh, a, a country's history where a lot would change i'm I mean, we keep exchanging these notes, right? I mean, next ten to twelve years yeah. is going to be very significant in India yeah. in terms of sports because there is a hope that Olympic will come uh, in that year, and people, kids, have a certain tangible goal and aspiration right now yeah. to go out and train, work hard so that they can be part of yeah. uh, the journey. Event, the yeah. journey, right? Yeah. Map what we have put together the. you know uh, how the sports systems work and parallel systems like you i want to quickly change gear to see someone who is doing good and what others can do so we briefly touched about bcci yeah. uh <laughs> cricket we know is massive in this country to an extent where it dominates yeah. 140 crore people uh we breathe we live uh you know we just talk about cricket all the time which is often other athletes have also spoken non cricketers uh, which is also unfair right but sometimes i also feel that it could also mean that that particular federation has perhaps done a really good work which other federations or organizations haven't been able to do so tell me in your experience of having dealt with so many federations what is that bcci has done good that cricket is a common topic or as they call it the religion of the country and what is that you feel other federations can do looking at what bcci has done i think the broadcasting the fact that you can watch any and every cricket match wherever our players are is amazing today if you want to see a badminton match you don't easily get it so broadcasting has played a big role because it's also got sponsors and brands involved and the money on that has obviously increased the leagues that they've created obviously has created a talent pool mm. and the kind of money that is coming in and the numbers we are talking about but overall the structure i think for any administration or federation there's a lot to learn and pick from the bcc but what is the starting point so i i have this conversation often in time that it could be broadcasting right yeah. not it could also be brands coming but the broadcasters sometimes say that because people are not watching we are not bidding for uh the broadcasting rights the brand say that because people are not playing we are not supporting a certain brand but on the other side we are also saying that you know you should broadcast this tournament which is happening perhaps in a metro city uh and yet people are not watching so what's the middle point i think the middle point is a couple of organi i mean right now uh, there is another company called fan code that has started uh, broadcasting matches of nationals khelo india and very interesting imagine a young uh, athlete being able to see their event being shown online uh, in fact uh, i think that is one starting point that you start showing matches in fact i remember abhinav bindra has said that 
if you really want to participate in sport go and watch a state event and a national event don't wait till they get to the olympics right because an athlete actually needs sure. that support at that point of time uh, the other thing i feel is the starting point was probably much earlier we are we are trying to compare cricket and other sports where the other sports curve of you know attention money all is started probably in the last decade you're talking about a 25 30 year old like post the last the world cup that we won the first world cup i think that's when you started seeing money in cricket till then it, we, we've seen the yeah. story right they yeah. also didn't have money they also yeah. had the same problems that other athletes have so i think from there how do you build it and mm. i think today we are in that when the cusp of something very meaningful the last decade was about creating these role models in different sports and saying yeah. hey we can do it but now how do we all come together and build the system of the sport uh, you see in odisha taking up hockey hockey yeah right as a state and they've gone all out so is that a model where everyone picks one sport and goes all out or there are multiple models for indian sport and i personally believe that talent is never going to be the issue sure. it is really how we sustain the governance and the processes and the systems and the money will come sure. uh, we ourselves as at an organization you know 15 years we started at we struggled to raise uh, funds and and today we you know thanks to csr and all our partners and donors we we are able to contribute to about 35 crores into indian sport which is a lot of money for sure. a foundation right i mean you you see startups also not seeing this kind of funds but if you look at it in the csr world in the last 5 years only 1% has come to sport and the conversations around medals will start now very soon yeah yeah right I mean, so it's not adding up it's like it's happening in silos today there is a lot of collaboration because i also sit on the tops committee i know that there's no duplication uh top elite athletes are taken care of the junior potential athletes are taken care of through foundations through the government through you know there are entities and collaborations that have started but the rest of the mm -hmm. athletes who have the potential to become this score 200 we need the corporate india to come in and right. play that and i'm rooting in more and more private corporate players to come in and you know uh, collaborate and partner with go sports other foundations to do what you're doing uh tell me if a kid today mm. who thinks that i am good at athletics a parent who is uh, seeing a certain spark or a talent on the kid what is that they should be doing to pursue aspiration they have either playing for the country or perhaps exploring sport as a career option and they would be from not so privileged background or they would be a typical middle class family where they cannot afford yeah. to spend on sports in everything else if it's a uh, career education we know you can go to you know uh, exams <laughs> and coaching centers yeah. and college how do they look at sp sport what do they do first i think most importantly don't do an early specialization and go into it in a way where they are 8 9 years old and you know you're like this is the next olympic champion because like i told you about the reasons of you know mind body the kid may not want to play after 4 years and sometimes i see parents have put in so much energy and money and attention into it and then they also get upset with the child and you know there are all those other dynamics and relationships but if you're a young talented athlete i would say dabble in two sports till the age of 12 13 gymnastic swimming cycling is a very very good base we have noticed that anybody who has had that kind of um uh, you know ability to uh, you, to strengthen their body type early years early, the early years early physiology right yeah. has uh, definitely a higher chance of excelling at a slightly older age you know people who uh, swim in lakes people who climb trees you, when we are when we do our uh, goal sheets and we try and understand in that through our applications it's very interesting to see that uh, the other thing is for a parent the pressure i think uh, I didn't do it. My child will do it. We see that a lot. Are they supposed to go to a coaching academy nearby? Definitely. Or they should put the kid into a local tournament uh, hmm. by themselves, or they should seek out professional support. I think the first step is finding a good coach okay. and trusting that the coach can manage your, you know, child's journey. Um, most of the time, 
parents do want to wait for results to come so they put them in a coaching academy and in 6 months if they're not winning some local competition change them to the next academy sport is a process it is a very long process it is a very difficult process you're going to have more losses than wins so having the patience and the ability to first trust your coach and then find an ecosystem that actually uh, works with you to tell you what is the right kind of thing so finding an environment that is good for your child so i think uh, today you have a lot of different academies that are providing you not just um uh, coaching but saying hey you should also look at a physio you should also look at a nutritionist you should also look at a trainer a couple of the projects and academies that we support we are trying to build in all of that into the academy irrespective if they are a direct athlete or not but expecting the athlete to excel early i okay. feel is a big problem in terms of uh, coaching finding the right coach is important and also having some sort of a mentor in that particular sport who they can guide most of the times we've seen they go to an uncle or they go to an aunt or they go to someone in the family who's never played the sport or probably played the sport 30 years ago who's not been in the sport if you've been continuously in the sport it's fine we are actually also planning to start something where we just are able to help parents understand what is the right thing to Very do Very important yeah. because we get so many queries uh, on a daily basis in fact i got an email many years ago saying my child is the next olympic champion and i was like oh super why don't you tell me what they're ranking where are they playing she's like no she's 2 years old mm. <laughs> so yeah. i was like okay <laughs> I, yeah so you know it is both sides you have sure. parents who are ready to let their children go all out and dream but you have another set of parents who all they want is their child to find a job through sport sure. a, a livelihood through sport so i think sport means different things to different sure. people and different levels of society yeah but um, definitely reaching out to us other organizations in the space sure. just so getting the, a guidance so the pursuit should be a first find a coach yeah. uh, a good coach uh, that itself uh, is a different checklist that how do you find a good yeah. uh, perhaps teams like you could put together uh, you know some content out there in the helping parents and kids understand uh, how to evaluate uh, find a good coach yeah. as a starting point yeah. find a good coach and then enroll yourself into a local academy start playing competitions now see how the kid is progressing mm. and then if they see there's a talent yeah. uh, potential and no pressure that you have to win a certain medal then maybe seek yeah. out help yeah. uh, but there are good chances that you your your talent scout team would anyway but we are not in the school and you okay. know that state level so you are already working at level mm-hmm. where the 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 athlete is already at a pro stage and at a national, national level stage, yeah. because the highest amount of dropout almost 75 to 80% happens at the national level okay. so i've played nationals for the country and then there's no pathway interesting but school programs are today actually making a comeback in a big way after school programs right. so we are tying up with a lot of those organizations which are spotting talent and saying hey how do we how do we guide them what can we do and and that's sure. interesting but yeah sure. there's no one it's an opportunity sure, yeah. i think to find that one organization yeah. that consults yeah. for these uh, for parents and for uh, athletes yeah one common name which kept coming in our discussion was rahul dravid <laughs> you have, have worked very closely with him tell me what is that you know about him which most people don't know <laughs> wow um I, i think everyone knows his humility uh for me in the last 12 years every single time i've had the opportunity to interact with him i have come out learning at least 10 things in my notebook is always full i always sit with a pen and paper um but this small chal- actually big challenges he throws to you when he's talking very calmly is actually the highlight he he'll probably says one line which is in that time you don't really pull it out but uh it's 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 a gem and it kind yeah. of can build an entire program or an entire thought process uh one thing that nobody knows and we've not really spoken about it too much is this role of a mentor so um he was in joseph smith nandan and you know they go back a long way but uh there was one conversation about hey i like what you are doing and how can i be involved and we also were wondering at that time like how do you involve someone like rahul into the project so 
uh, we had uh, uh, you know an executive coach called Girish Manimaran uh, and uh, we all sat together and while in discussion we came up with this whole concept of a mentor and he said coach is great but mentor is a great thing so even before he took up that mentor role into the Indian cricket team we started the Rahul Dravid athlete mentorship program and this Olympics we have close to about seven or eight of them from that program that we started two Olympic cycles back who are going in now Excellent. so I think the mentor role um, is a unique thing that Excellent. just came yeah. to my mind now. you yeah, you created a mentor <laughs> for millions of uh, people <laughs> yeah. now um, you support Nikhat uh, Zareen, right? She's uh, one of the finest boxers we have, uh, won so many medals in the country. What made you decide to support her? I think we started supporting uh, Nikat after she became a world champion. I think it's one of our athletes who we picked after they had become a champion because that's something we usually don't do. Uh, Nikat, I actually had the chance with my colleagues to go to a home and uh, I was amazed at why she is playing the sport. I think that was so heartening because she was constantly told growing up that don't take up a boy's sport. She would come back with bruises all over and her grandmother would say, who's going to marry you? And uh, very recently she, she was mentioning that the best message I got recently was from a schoolmate that said that Nikat, you are really inspiring us. Thank you for playing the sport. She's like, I never thought that my school friends will actually look at me. So the reason she's playing the sport is obviously because she wants to win. But that underlying responsibility of what can a girl like me who comes from this region or from a background that does not encourage sport for women, what does it mean? So I think that that is a very critical piece of every athlete that we work with they may not go on to become Olympic champions and world champions, but do they have that ability to think beyond their sport, give back, pay it forward, uh, whether it is a Rahul Dravid or a Pulela Gopichand or an Abhinav Bindra who was also on our board for many years and guided us. All three of them are legends of their sport. And when you look back at each of their journeys, that humility that ability to give yeah. back and the pay it forward. So if we can build 200, 500 young citizens of this country yeah. into good citizens, I yeah. think our job is done. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about women in sports. Mm. Right? A lot has been spoken. A lot has been, uh, a lot is happening, mm. right? Tell me a very honest on the ground uh, situation. Like what is really happening? Because... Uh, I don't know why specifically we talk about women in sports because sports for me when you know back in the days in school you know my uh, colleagues uh, uh, girls they were playing mm. uh, we keep seeing kids uh, girls down in you know residential com colonies playing so there's always an impression that girls are playing sports mm. right now but when you look fast forward we are not seeing girls or women playing sports at a pro level yeah. so they are playing when they are kids but for the next 15, 20 years, we are not seeing pro uh, mm. athletes. Uh, mm. So what's missing? What's happening? Or there is a lot happening which is not been spoken. What's the current landscape? I think the if there is a boy and a girl in the family in a humble background, and I'm not, I think what we are seeing is in cities. If you go into tier two, tier three cities, I don't think there is that much of encouragement to young girls to pursue the sport. And especially in in whether it's education also, the number one problem in education also is if there's a boy and a girl, let the boy study, the girl will anyway get married and, you know, she doesn't need the education. But I think when girls have been given the opportunity to play, it is incredible to see what they have done. And not just them, we've, we've had conversations where they're like, ma'am, please, inko bhi lelo, agar ye aayegi, to mera pura colony aa sakta hai, then we can come together, we can do this, we can do that. So, they are never thinking about them and their sport. At least I've, I've seen how these young girls from different places have uh, come up. Another thing is just confidence. A lot of them play, play the sport because they're either bullied or they're harassed or... Uh, you know, there was one athlete uh, who said, you know, she had very lovely long hair 
and the next time i met her she had cut her hair and she was wearing a cap and she had a jacket till here and i was like what happened why are you you know what happened to your lovely hair you loved it and she is like nahi ma'am jab main ghar se training jati hu to itne boys hai sab mujhe chidate hai uh, so abhi main aise jaungi to main ladka jaise dikhta hu you know it, it really hurt me and pained me that someone is you know be- because they want to play sport and they the mm. the challenges that they are actually going through or they're not allowed to wear shorts they're not allowed to uh, i mean it, there's a lot happening on ground but despite that to be able to make it and if you see our results any money put into women's sport they don't give up they don't stop playing they are at it because their mission is you know they're just trying to prove it to so many people not just family friends but schools and communities and you know it's like i will not let this opportunity down so even someone like a nikat um adipa karmakar and you know bhavani devi in fact when she got our scholarship in her application form she had said if i don't win and get any support this is my last year of playing the sport and this was 7 years back and she actually made it to the olympics so we've lost so many talent like right. that as a country because that right time you know we missed out so when now when we talk about a, a pv sindhu or mm. a mary com mm. uh, or a meera bai mm. or a nikhat or a saina neval what is that happened for them uh, which if it can happen at scale uh, we can see more women in sports i personally feel family support parents a very integral part of that belief system i think we are a function of our upbringing and you know whatever we've had access to early years so if we are able to create a ecosystem and also show that sport is not the end of their career but a but there is something beyond that there is a livelihood there's a career there is opportunities and today there's funding and medals and you know all the other things that have come in i think that pathway they have made it themselves these they've all made it despite the system today's youngsters are seeing it they 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 look at the kind of prize money each state is giving i mean i'm i'm not a big fan of it but uh, i hope that same money comes into the development of sure. the sport yeah. because you're saying i'll give you 1 crore when you win the medal and they also get on time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly so so i think women in sport Uh, it's 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 not just for that athlete but it becomes for the community i think that's definitely something that we've seen and uh, the ability to build that uh, confidence that uh, they are not less and uh, we are not less as as women uh, the kind of results that they're showing our first medalist karna maleshwari ma'am i mean her journey is also yeah. so inspiring how she went on to do it and it took us so many years to get back to as a weightlifting as a medal right yeah. so that system has to be continuous and not be broken i, I think we're sitting on a gold mine right. <laughs> boys girls sure. we can win a lot of lot, have lot of champions now there's a lot we discuss deeply i mean one important topic which is also close to us at rain matter to me personally and i'm and i know it's for you and your team also is para athletes uh, right uh very underrated uh not spoken much uh i want you to quickly touch upon india's history of paralympics and para athletes right not many people know we have we have we have many four to five world record holders yeah. uh, right uh, uh what's our history how how have we done uh in compared to the world uh landscape and uh, what looks to be a future to us I think the Paralympic movement has had exponential growth. Um, our first para champion was actually Murli Kant Petkar ji. It's a film that everybody is watching right now. Yeah. Uh, again, someone who has a Indian Army background, you yeah. know, and 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 then come in there. Then you had far and few people who somehow made it. The committee was not. in its full operations but whatever they managed to send athletes i i personally feel the turning point started at 2016 rio where we actually sent our largest contingent i think we were about 19 people in the contingent okay 20, the, the 2016 rio 2016 okay. rio 
and I'm saying 19 was our largest. Now we may have about 70 people. Uh, and it's really close, right, in terms and of... And how are we in terms of other countries? <laughs> yeah, so when I was in uh, Rio, 19 was our contingent and we got, you know, in the village, athlete village, you get uh, places to stay. So depending on how big your contingent is, they give you a floor or they get... So we had a floor. China had three buildings mm. <laughs> because they were over 300 people. And, you know, for us, it was like, oh my God, if we... India is probably in the top three in the world with people with disabilities. And uh, most of them are actually not even sometimes let out of their homes. Forget playing sport. A large part of para-athletes come through the system either through injury and they are recommended swimming. So they mostly, most of the para-athletes have their base in swimming. And once they get into swimming, they get into understanding, oh, there is para-sports and now I'll get it. Thankfully, now you have a few role models like Sumit Antil, you have a Suhas, you yeah. have a Deepa Malik, a Varun Bhati, a Devendra Jajariya. You have enough names across the country who have done it, right? So, people now know that I can also create an identity for myself through sport. So, what is the origination here for disabled people? They have an aspiration to play sport or like you said, in the army because they were in service and now they're disabled and therefore sports can be an alternative career. Where is the talent pool coming from? Yeah. So, people with disabilities come in two formats in my experience. I'm sure I might be missing out some things, but you're either born with the disability hmm. or something happens in your life either an accident or a medical reason mm. that you become, uh, you know, you, you get the disability. And there is a saying that um, if the glasses were not in, invented, many of us would actually be people with disability, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, so, so, so I think it is, there is a percentage of people who are people with disabilities, uh, who come through different, now there are state associations, there are state federations, very similar to the format we spoke about, able-bodied, also in people with disabilities, there is there. So the Paralympic Committee of India is the main setup managing this, with state federations again helping out. There's a long way to go in professionalizing it, but today I think because of people with disabilities being included into Arjuna Awards, into uh, Khel Ratnas, into everything else, there is a thing that, hey, I can also do this for my country. So there right. is a patriotism reason of why people are coming and also a health reason. But having said that, it is very, very difficult um, for an athlete because we, one thing I've learned is they hate being called superheroes. They yeah. don't want to be called. They're like, you just make treat us normally, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't want... Dramatizing yeah. a simple identity. They, you know, they just want to be treated like how you and I want to be treated. So, I think the the there's a large uh, um, number of athletes getting into athletics and para swimming, naturally. Uh, but today there is para shooters, there is para badminton, there is, you know, and again, each of them have their yeah. own governing bodies and federations and it's to see how para badminton has also grown in our countries. We have uh, probably three or four world number ones in their categories of disability. And you support one of them? Suhas? Yes, yes. We yeah. support three of them actually. Wow. But yeah, Suhas is an incredible, uh, you know, uh, person to speak about because he's not just a Paralympic medalist, but yeah. he's also an IAS officer. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, thanks to someone who pinged me and then I read that he's supported by you. It's 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 a rare uh, human breed like he's a computer science engineer yeah. uh, an IS of acting IS yeah. officer uh, at the Carter and uh, a world number one yeah uh, right and so, I remember during Tokyo because it was also COVID times and he was involved in the management of the COVID processes procedures he was really busy during the day so you're like how will you play what is going to happen and he's like no no I fixed my time to play from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. that was his training time he would sleep for three, four hours and again go back to his work. So he's an incredible breed, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. You don't see too many of them. But he says that because of his sport, it keeps him going in his work. Uh, we recently also had a shooter in the able-bodied category, actually, Tejas, who cracked the IAS exams. Impressive. Uh, you know, he had, again, he's, he was doing well. He was in the national team, but he was feeling he's stagnating and he started studying for his IS exams. And he said, I followed the same process 
that I do with my sport and I cracked the exam. Wow. So it is, you know, again, we were very excited because these are the stories sure. that should actually, you know, come out because people think you're playing sport and you're wasting your time. But yes. you could play sport and do something so different and be in service and really, you know, earn a great livelihood as well. So uh, tell me for, uh, for people with disability, yeah. uh, uh, the para-athletes, how's that sporting system mm. and infrastructure? Like mm. we have the Ministry of Sports mm. and the SAI, uh, is there a separate team, a separate federation or do they come a subset of the existing one? No, so even they have an affiliation to the Sports Authority of India. Okay. I think what's really good that our government is looking at it from an inclusion standpoint. So there's equal support, even they are part of TOPS, Junior TOPS, all of the Similar support that an able-bodied athlete gets, also a para-athlete gets. But in terms of systems, like from the state to the national, hmm. uh, what happens in the disability space is there is something called as an international classification that I should get. Unfortunately, in India, we don't do an international classification. So if I am a person with disability, say in uh, Sonipat, I will have to get a national classification by doctors here during a competition. And that is just a temporary one. That is not a national ranking, uh, national okay. classification for me. I have to go for a competition outside India, which is a lot of money. In an able-bodied athlete, you have probably, a, a, you know, the, the athlete, if they're a minor, their parent will travel. So it's two people's cost going, right? Even if you're saying somewhere in Asia, it's about three lakhs. Yeah. Now, what happens in the para space, it is me... If I'm on a wheelchair, depending on my height, weight, size, I might need help and escorts. I might have one or two. If I'm a minor, I also have my parent. So you're talking about four people traveling with for one athlete, mm. right? So the ecosystem that we've had to build and understand has been very different. Or you have people who have a polio disability or, you know, some other disabilities where they can manage on their own. And so it really depends on that. So the classification is very important. Anybody who is, you know, a person with disability who wants to get into para sport, the good part is the age is not a criteria. Okay. You can, if you can move and you're, you, you can manage to choose your and pick your sport, you can play at up to any age. Uh, in fact, Deepa Malik, when she won her medal, I think was in her late 40s. Uh, so there is no age is not the barrier. And, uh, you know, an accident could happen at yeah. any point. And I always say that we're all currently able-bodied, right? Because when we hear these stories, I have a beautiful story of an athlete, so inspiring and heartbreaking at the same time of Sumit until we all know Neeraj Chopra and we all talk about him and he's amazing as an athlete. Exactly in the same sport of javelin you have Sumit until who is a world record holder currently, uh, was training to be a wrestler, was actually returning home after his training and uh, there was, um, you know, um, a, 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 a vehicle coming in front of him with one headlight. And he thought, okay, it's a two-wheeler. Unfortunately, it was, a, it was a truck with only one headlight. So he went head on and his life changed overnight. So from wrestling, he moved to javelin and he's a world record holder. And in Tokyo, in the event, three times he broke his own world record. Wow. And his aim is, I'm going to get so good that I'm going to compete with Neeraj. <laughs> I'm going to go to the, you know, and he'll do it. And he's on a prosthetic leg. So in the para space, that's the kind of work that we do, Inspiring. which is we will find the right prosthetics. We will speak to the companies, make sure it is, you know, made for them, custom made. And we don't even have 5% probably of the products that other athletes use in other countries in India available wow. easily. I mean, wow. we are procuring it, but there should be a better system for movement and accessibility. Yeah. I mean, when, when wherever I've seen in events and games, people have, they don't have escorts unless their disability is very high. They have all automated stuff. So at least the athletes that are part of our programs, um, you know, we we've, we've tried our best to research and understand what's available outside and give them 
uh, all of this access. But that's just the 40 of them that we work. Sure. There are 140 or 50 no, waiting no, I'm to... I'm sure you brought this. I mean, we'll make a call out, uh, use this opportunity for any company which is trying to solve and build. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you should come, talk yeah. uh, and uh, help these athletes because only then, uh, like you said, that ecosystem will uh, develop Absolutely. since we are talking about para athletes right there's also confusion and perhaps there's also lack of understanding about uh, what really defines in para athlete and i know you have a lot to share about it so for the understanding of people listening and watching how do you define in para athlete uh, and what level or grade if mm -hmm. i may because i've seen even for a 400 meter there would be a multiple people who yeah. have records yeah. uh, even for badminton there are different levels yeah. uh, so i think Para-athlete is a person with physical disability. Uh, that is the first base of it. So I need to have a, a physical disability which can be, uh, you know, when, when a classification is given, they need to know the extent of, for example, if I did not have, uh, you know, this part of my uh, body, you know, from the elbow to the, uh, the remaining part, I fall under a another category because the amount of movement that I have in my body is restricted. So I can't play with somebody who does not have both their arms. So depending on my physical disability, I'm put into different categories of classification so that the level playing ground is fair to some extent. It is not, but to some extent, at least there's a range. Okay. Uh, so this that so is... So your opponent should have a similar or almost at par almost, of disability. Yes, okay. almost at par. Which and is, there is some body which is defining this? Yes. So the International Paralympic okay. Committee has already laid out the rules of what are all the events. So there are track events, there's swimming events. Swimming event goes from... Um, um, S1 to S14. S1 is probably people with no limbs and no hands, um, no feet, ha legs and no uh, arms, right? And they're still swimming. Wow. Uh, and I've seen that in uh, Rio and I, I mean, it, it, it was shocking because they hold the towel to the, at the start point and when the whistle blows, then they start swimming. So it really depends on what category you are and you may not have too many people in each category, right? Because again, awareness, ability to play the sport, can you come in? What's interesting is para badminton has created a very big set of uh, athletes who've come into the fore. Even over there, you have short stature, where if you're in the dwarf uh, you know, category, um, or if you don't have one leg or you don't have an arm, then you're in a different category. So which is why you may have three world number ones in para badminton in that category. Oh, okay. So that is something uh, in, in each sport, in you would each, have different yeah. world uh, champs, but yeah. in different categories. Yeah, in different yeah. categories. So it's always. And Suhas is, I think, uh, world number one in in S, his category. category. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so for example, his his has been inflicted through polio, okay. and uh, what's interesting is, in the Paralympics, maybe by the next Paralympics, because polio has been eradicated now globally as well, you may not have that category at all. Okay. Uh, so it's also dependent on the how medical science is also sure. moving and what is the disability that's currently there. But I think the uh, aspects that we've had a chance uh, to be part of, there was this one um, taekwondo athlete, uh, uh, you know, where she went through a, a procedure for some sort of a um, gynecological issue and they happened to insert the anesthesia in, in the wrong vein or artery and they had to amputate her in half an hour. So her life changed over half an hour and then they have to re refigure and configure every single thing about their life. So when I have spoken to uh, people with uh, disability, for example, there is an amazing swim, para Paralympic swimmer called uh, Sharat Gaikwad, yeah. right? Uh, he, he was one of our early scholars. Uh, so Sharat was born with a disability. So he's, he's never felt like something has changed overnight. So it's very important for all of us as people to realize that especially through accidents, med medical negligence is a very a big part of it and also medical procedures because of health itself, there has to be amputation done for medical reasons. Your life takes a 360 degree turn. So how do you then manage and come back, play, win and become world number one. I think their journeys are, uh, you know, really, really inspiring because 
it's even basic things of movement sitting up eating uh, you know we we know people with uh, disabilities uh, on wheelchair uh some of them are waist waist down paralysis or neck down paralysis we've just started a sport called boccia you know it's like bowling but they take it and then they throw it and it's a it's a one of the biggest paralympic sports but that is for people with waist down uh, sorry neck down disability and it's just picking up in india but there are already about 80 90 athletes who are doing boccia now and in india in india and in chandigarh this coach who understood bocha who started up a center and who's you know teaching kids and people from everywhere suddenly these people with this extreme disability also are finding an avenue through sport okay. so it's been very heartening to see again in the number of events we are not participating in all we are probably participating in 8 to 10 events out of the 20 25 available so if you go across the breadth of india and see the disabilities that are there we could have many 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 more people who take up sport and i think in all my interactions the one thing that sport has given them is an identity which is so beautiful uh, there's an archer called uh, rakesh kumar in jammu he had an accident and he would sit near a tea stall and uh, his coach would come there for tea and he was a big built guy and he's just sitting there on a you know on the ground and he's like what are you doing why don't you come and i'll teach you archery and in 3 years dilip he's learned he's a world champion and now he's going to the paralympics as well wow. in fact he's partnering sheetal devi sheetal as well devi, yeah. uh, you know they both are partners and if all goes well they'll hopefully come back with a medal yeah. right so everywhere we look and see there are these stories and there are people who don't know about para sport sure, so yeah. a large part of our efforts also at go sports and through our partners has been to how do you promote this so uh, sony pictures was one of our partners and kapil sharma uh, you know the show the comedy show was a, is is quite well known across the country so post the rio uh, uh, Paralympics. They invited the entire contingent. Then they spoke about them, and we saw a big set of people's interest peak because it went into small towns, and you know, again, the power of media, right? Yeah. Uh, because newspapers, social media is only can limited. is is yeah. limited to that extent. This suddenly we saw so many applications, people coming and saying, "How do I get into sport?" Again, similar problem with the able-bodied, but yeah. I think this is a common thread coming up of. and is it, is it fair uh, i don't know if at all mm. it's qualifies to comparison but i'm just trying to find a impetus that uh, is it fair to say that between para athletes and the able body athletes uh, you know para athletes have done reasonably well considering the focus in attention what they have got the infrastructure what they got is there general any observations or thought you have got between them i think definitely uh, we are not we are not at all an accessible country it is very tough yeah. you have you need three four people lifting a wheelchair to just get in and people think if i put a ramp we are accessible there are so many the range of disability is so different that a a ramp is not going to solve the problem yeah. right so i think with the infrastructure with the amount of funding with the amount of whatever that is there they've done an incredible job yeah uh, which is why you know they need a lot of the attention, attention and yeah. the credit but um, i i so so the uh, who had done a world campaign called we the 15 15 percent of the world is actually people with disabilities wow and uh, they have a beautiful film i'll send it to you which they made uh, during the tokyo olympics to talk about this right that how do they want to be like they just want to be treated normally and yeah, sure. it's a lovely 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 wow. video uh, you know um, which they put together and then you realize that it is it today we are talking about people with disability but an aging population needs the same set of accessibility so if you're building something for india on accessibility you can also it's also going to be used by our older people or some of us depending on how what happens in life yeah. so i think accessibility needs to be looked at in a very very uh, different way not just from physical accessibility but also in our teams in our organizations are we also hiring people with disabilities are we giving them that opportunity are we making a point to you know like how we made the point about women in the workforce 
I think even people with disabilities has to be right up there because they are not getting that opportunity yeah. and jobs are not available. Uh, so it's tough. One of our shooters, actually Sonia Sharma, she did pretty well at the nation level and all of that. Then she gave some exams and now she's joined in Bangalore in the income tax department. Right. So suddenly she's closed the loop of livelihood, identity and to manage her own expenses going forward. So some beautiful, uh, you know, stories. Yeah, no, I'm sure. I mean, this very impressive. Uh, like I said, I mean, uh, uh, having known you guys, I'm tracking the athletes, what you guys uh, cheer and support for. It's very impressive. Uh, people like Suhas, uh, so many other athletes yeah. out there. Pranay, I've had a, yeah. you know, uh, we took time, sat yeah. together. Uh, incredible work. Thank uh, you. As we speak now, we are, you know, few days a week out from the 2024 uh, olympics and then we have the paralympics india is sending as of now around 117 odd athletes uh, the number of para athletes are not confirmed but it's estimated to be 50 odd yeah uh, you have a fair good contingent <laughs> contribution to that uh, uh, team which is going in what is your message to a kid Maybe a kid might not be watching it on the YouTube, but let's say someone who is 12 plus, parents allowed them to watch and listen this, or the parent is watching and they have a kid. Uh, for that kid to pursue sport, or for the parent to continue support their kid, and seed an aspiration for a 2028, 32, 36 beyond Olympics, what is that your one recommendation you have to all of them to why they should pursue sport and why they should keep that so-called dream uh, of going and playing for the country. That's a very difficult question. That's why I asked you because <laughs> you, you have the vantage point of answering that. <laughs> oh, okay. I think um, the power of sport and the beauty of sport has to be instilled at a very young age. Many of us come in much later into sport, right? Because of health reasons or whatever. But if you understand the joy that sport brings to you the the ability to lose every day and wake up the next morning and come up with a new strategy i think just if parents can share that message that the power of sport of winning and losing is much bigger than the olympic dream I think we'll be a super nation. I mean, if all our youngsters think that it's important to be, um, you know, healthy, it's important to play fair, there's no shortcuts, there's no jugad, you know, the country sometimes is known for all these things and only sport probably gives you that platform to not deviate from your core things that you stand for. So... As a young parent, I, I feel if we can talk to these kids about who these athletes are, tell them their backgrounds, talk to, you know, a lot, lot more children today are looking at football and looking at international football, but they have no idea about who their champions are. So, Neil Chetri is, you know, probably one of the greatest football players and many people don't even know, though they follow football. So, I think know your stars, know your champions, find their journeys and stories. Yeah. We are going to try our best to put it out in a much more meaningful way. We started doing that and we're getting a lot of response, uh, you know, huge credit to Nayan and the team as well because otherwise they don't know what their backgrounds are. Even someone like a Chirag and Satvik come from two parts of the yeah. country, decided to play doubles together and how they take the sport forward is very different. So, a parent, a child, a grandparent, anybody sitting and watching together, don't just watch the sport and the result, but try and find out who they are, where they've come from, and what a big achievement it is to just be at the Olympics, irrespective of the medals, irrespective of everything. Out of 1.4 billion, 117 have actually made it. It says something, right? Yeah that they are truly special in every every possible way. They are magicians in their own right. And if we can support them and back them and participate through that way, that's all matters, I think. I got goosebumps <laughs> when you were telling about the numbers. Uh, I think uh, it's no doubt incredible. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping and we are hoping as a team that uh, the conversation we had today would serve some seed for us 
collectively as a society as a nation yeah. to talk about sports beyond just one or two sports yeah. uh, participate in sports uh, be a more sports participating country rather than being a spectator sports <laughs> country and then cheer for everyone involved in sports whether they may be winning a medal or perhaps not winning a medal but like you said just to get to the court every day uh, training so many hours and then go out and represent the country it takes a special person to be there yeah. thank you for <laughs> having this conversation thank, thank you, you so for much. Uh, telling everything and i mean i learned a lot uh, <laughs> thank you and thank you for doing what you do good luck to your team i'm i'm sure you're chasing not medals but aspirations which are way beyond uh, 24 and uh, hope to sit back with you again very soon and talk about uh, what india did in 24 olympics yeah. and paralympics thank you so much it has been an honor to be here and discuss all this you know sometimes we doing the day to day stuff but you don't really sit back and talk about it in this format but thank you for uh having these conversations and i i hope uh, that the power of sport and the joy of sport continues to be the main reason of why this is important for india yep thank you so much thank uh, you. <laughs> so that was deepthi from go sports we leave a link if any of you would like to reach out to support the work what they do send uh, greetings and uh, wishes to the athletes they support i hope the conversation we had today would in some sense inspire people around you or to you to not just make or keep sports and as an extra curricular activity maybe as a primary activity to your kid to your sibling to anyone around you uh, to cheer them and not just say ki sports mein kya hoga we need to make this country a sports powerhouse we have a huge potential like deepthi said although we are sending 117 athletes we have potential to triple that or more and so much talents in so many different corners of this country so please let's have uh, these conversations more not just because this is a olympic year but we should have this every month you know every quarter talk about sports which is beyond cricket only then we'll uh, truly truly love being a sportsman uh, all of us have a hidden athlete in us <laughs> we just have to find the reason to find that athlete in us thank you for uh, staying so far and uh, if you like what we do please do send me some feedback that's the only way we can get better in what we do and uh, see you next time uh, with another guest exploring the other side goodbye